like chili, but I like it. A few years ago, my thyroid was really, really bad. Well, good morning, church. Morning. Morning. I hear there's some really awful treats over there today. <laughs> and and the person that started that rumor was over there munching on them, so I'm thinking he just wants them all for himself. So don't pay any attention to that. They're awfully tempting. As well. Awfully tempting. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. They're awfully tempting. Well, if you're watching online, you need to come and try some of these awfully tempting treats. <laughs> We're glad that you're all here. If you are online, please shout out in the comments and let us know that you're here by just telling us hi this morning. Uh, this Wednesday, we will continue our group study at 7 o'clock with uh, the second uh, episode of The Chosen. And it's like, after Wednesday night, it's like... Uh, can we just watch the next one? Because we wanted to see what happened next. Yeah. This is like, it's like those cliffhangers. Fortunately, it's not a season ending cliffhanger that you have to wait till the next season to watch. But uh, we'll be watching that on Wednesday night along with some great discussion and prayer. And then Saturday, this came quick. <laughs> Please be sure to join us as we have our um, July Men's Breakfast at 9 o'clock this Saturday. Uh, that also brings the fact that we are almost on top of the 4th of July. Yeah. So get lots of things coming up and then certainly uh, the following Saturday. So we're just going to race right in, get the pun there, we're going to race right into Orange Tracks uh, <laughs> July races uh, with registration at 930 and racing at 10. And then we're going to tear down race, the racetrack and not put back the sanctuary, but put back, uh, put into place our theater and our 12 foot screen. And we'll be showing a free uh, viewing of Jesus Revolution along with some, probably some more of those awful treats and uh, popcorn and hot dogs and drinks. Concessions, like the movie, are free. Unlike the movie, concessions are only as long as they last so be sure to get here doors do open at 5 30 and concessions are ready right pretty much right at 5 30 so you can enjoy that also be sure to grab some of these they're right over there on the uh, welcome table uh, we've already had one great story of how uh, one of those tickets was able to be used to not just invite somebody to a movie but to invite someone to church so a uh, great tool to do that. And it's a great showing, it's a great movie, depending on which side of the aisle you want to be on. I mean, the secular people are kind of downplaying it, but you know, we've talked about the fact that the uh, baptism scene in that movie that happened at that time has been recreated this year, and it wasn't 4,000, it's now been estimated at 5,000 baptisms. Can you imagine? <laughs> arms would be pretty tired. I know Mark and Abby's in there pretty tired. We'd have to get volunteers to help us with that, with getting them. But what a way to reach out to our, our, uh, our community with a movie that really has a countercultural uh, spin to it. Oh, gee, just as relevant today as it was back in the 70s. So we invite you to join us for that. Uh, if you're watching online or even here, Go out to GraceStreet.Church and you can click on Grace Street Cinema and there's some inf more information about the movie as well as the movie trailer. If you're watching online after the videos that are in the link for worship that will be posted up there for you, there's a trailer for both the movie and for our Bible study series, The Chosen. So uh, please uh, check that out after you've watched the music videos. Let's slow down a little bit, and, and just in, in the vein of today's message, to rest. Let's just take a moment to rest in God. Father God, we come before you this morning, and as we prepare our hearts and our minds to hear what you have for us this morning, Father, we ask that you would calm us, no matter what else is going on, uh, not just in the world, but in our personal lives, Father, that you would settle our hearts. Prepare us and calm us, Father. 
so that as we hear the words that you've given to Pastor Mark to teach us this morning, that we can truly hear them and that we can they would resonate with us and that we can walk out of this place using those instructions and, and that teaching in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And this morning, in addition to um, thinking about the, the message that Mark had, and Diane actually posted a picture up on social media this morning, but she goes, you got to come here and look out the back door. I see the shadow. And on this shadow was a cross. And it's just like, you know, God, you're good. Your little reminders everywhere of, of the fact that you are there. In our call to worship this morning, we're going to expand a little bit further on a passage that we heard last week, which is Isaiah 43, and not just verse 1, but verses 1 through 3. And this comes to the New Revised Standard Version. And here's what Isaiah says. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And before I go any further, can you all that, everyone that last week that was here and was in the service or, or Wednesday night that watched it, that can you hear the little girl Mary's voice. I'm not even trying to replicate it, but I can hear it rolling around in my head. But here's what comes after that. Isaiah continues and says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Can you hear the hope that comes from this? Not just that first part where it says, I, I have called you, by, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. But it goes further. And the Lord speaking through Isaiah tells us that we'll pass through waters. We'll pass, not just waters, but rivers. Flames. In other words, we're gonna we're gonna run into all kinds of troubles in our lives. Any amount of trouble. And, and you know, those of you that are on our, our prayer chat, you know that uh, my daughter went into the hospital over the weekend with chest pains and problems with her kidneys, and she's stage four kidney can uh, kidney disease. So this is just you know something that she lives with, but she knows the Father. And she knows that God's got her and that no matter what she goes through, whether the, you know, the waters, however deep that is, however fast that current is, however big that fire is, that she's going to come out on the other end with God by her side. And just as God created Israel, and because we're talking about Israel here, because they were special enough, he created each of us. So that he could do this. He knows us. He can call us by name. He will bring us through this. Here's the other piece of this. And this is what I'm going to leave you with before we bring Mark up here to, to teach us the rest of the, the message today. In God, we can find rest. Because when you try to do it yourself, what happens? You work really hard and... More often than not, it doesn't go so well. Let us focus on God. Let us focus on what Jesus has done for us. And no matter how hard it is, we can still find that rest. Father God, as we bring Pastor Mark up here to teach, we ask that every word that comes from his mouth is from you, Father. And that anything that is not, well, we just won't pay any attention. But that rarely, if ever, happens with Pastor Mark. Because you have anointed him with your word, Father. You have anointed him as your messenger to us. And we thank you for that. So, Father God, let us hear what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Pastor Kerry. Good morning, church. Good morning. Shabbat Shalom. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Well, you'll know all about that in a little while. I've got to tell you what a great God we, we have and, and who uh, serves us as we serve him. Does that make sense? So last week, after I left church here, I took a little bit of a drive. And I drove from here down to Corinth, Mississippi, uh, part of my 3,000 miles in the week. Um, but the real interesting part was, is I got down south uh, into Tennessee, and I'd been driving through rainstorms, pretty bad ones, and then it turned from rainstorms into severe thunderstorms, and the roads were flooding over, and it was blowing like crazy, and I had rooster tail shooting off, off my front fenders because there was so much water in the road. And I lost my headlights. Uh, I shorted it out. So I had my driving lights on the front of my car. And so for the next 200 miles at night in the middle of a storm, I drove off those to get to Corinth, Mississippi. What I didn't understand at the time was I also drove through two tornadoes getting down there. That's why everything was just going crazy, horrible weather. And she, she kept calling me and calling me, and I was trying to concentrate on the road. But she was freaking out. It was odd that he was still there. Oh my gosh! So I'm I'm going down the road like this, going, oh thank you, know, thank you, Lord. God was lighting up the highway with lightning, <laughs> so I could see where I was going. Uh, but. He brought me through it. And I just kept praying over and over again, God, get me there safe, get me there safe. Lori was saying the same thing. And he got me there safe. I didn't really realize until the next morning when I got up and went to leave the hotel, figured out that the hotel was running off the generators. Power out, lines down everywhere, trees down, houses flat, you name it. And drove in storms all the way then into Georgia. Um, where I finally got stopped at an auto parts store and got new headlights and put in my car. So, um, but God, there was a storm, a bad storm, and a storm some people wouldn't make it through. And part of my message today is about that. We're always going to have storms in our lives, but God brings us through it. If we are faithful, we got to involve God up front. We got to, we got to involve God. We got to invite Him into this, into the storm with us, and that He will walk us through the storm. It's a separate message, kind of, but tied in today. So, our focus of our sermon today is focused on everything is dead until Jesus enters the picture. So, kind of hang on to that thought a little bit as we go through this today. And that doesn't really sound all that appealing at first until we stop and we think about it for a minute. Everything is dead until Jesus enters the picture. See, it's quite a great thing once we think about it a little bit. We were dead in our sins with no perceivable way out. Then Jesus steps in and brings us salvation through his grace and his love. So what could be perceptible as a bad thing that we were dead, we were dead in all things. But then Jesus steps in and makes us a new being, a new life, and gives us restoration. Takes us out of that sin. So I have a question for you. How many times in life do you ever feel that you're in an impasse? You know, just an impasse. Mm -hmm. No perceivable way to get around the thing. And you know, no way out. And sometimes we feel like we just have hit rock bottom. Things aren't going our way. And they don't seem to ever want to go our way. Ever been there? Been there many times in life. And it's not a pleasant place to be. It really isn't. And it doesn't mean that we have to stay there for eternity. Although at the time it usually seems like it is an eternity. That we're stuck there. We just can't seem to get around it. But we have options. We always have options. So option number one 
if you don't have faith or a belief system, you may end up sinking into your own understanding. Think about that one for a minute. And drown in what I love to call the pity pool with little or no hope. See, if we don't have faith and we don't have a basis for faith and we don't know that there's something better to come, we're just stuck in the mire. We're mired down in it and we don't see a way to get out of it. And really, truly, without faith, without having that hope on the other side, we may never get out of it. And that's why a lot of people give up their lives. They commit suicide. And that's not an option. That's not an option. But see, we have option number two. As believers then, with faith, we can call in reinforcements. Now, reinforcements can come in many, many different forms, but they usually all come from the same source. So we have to invoke the source of those reinforcements, and then reinforcements can come. So what I'm saying here as a believer and as a member of a community of believers, the church, we are never left to do anything on our own. You ever think about it that way? We are never left to do anything on our own. So as believers, we are called to edify each other, to lift ourselves up out of that pit, out of the problems that we have. We are called to edify each other, to build each other up. And if we call out to Jesus, he will send hope. Now our job, our job is to recognize that help when he sends it and use it when it's given. Does that make sense? <laughs> How many times have we looked past the help that God sends us? Unfortunately, it happens. And we miss out on what God is trying to do in our lives. And I love to call that spiritual short-sightedness. Spiritual short-sightedness. God sends us the help. We, we ask for help. He sends us help. But we don't recognize the help when he sends us. And so we just shove it off to the side. Spiritual short-sightedness. So what we want to do is, starting today, I want you to look for those hidden little treasures that God sends to us when we call out to Him. Okay? So our scripture focus today is one that's very, very special to me. And uh, so I chose that as our call to worship. And that scripture is Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. And we'll read that in a minute, but I wanted to kind of explain what I'm talking about here. See, back in 1985, I was kind of lost in a worldly place, if you will. And at the time, I didn't even realize that I was lost. And a lot of us go through that in life on a regular basis. We don't even know how lost we are until we understand what being lost is. And so that's where I was. I was lost in this worldly place, and I was a DJ down at KRNA. And uh, I had a very good time slot, had really good ratings at the time. So, you know, I had all these things going on. And I was pretty pumped up about what I had done. Hmm. Did you notice anything about what I just said there? What did I say? Well, did you notice how many eyes there were in there? And see, that was the problem. Me. I was my own problem. But I couldn't see it at the time. I couldn't see that I was my own problem. See, even though it, it was going great, so I thought, I was lost in this worldly place. Now here's the key. It was still part of God's plan because God uses that experience of being on the radio and doing all these things as I went in to do some Christian radio at the time and did some other things as well. But see, I just didn't know how lost I was in the world at the time because I had built this whole little world all around me. God wasn't much of a part of it at that time. So anyway, I just got off the stage from introducing a group at the concert. You may have heard of the group, the name is Petra, and they are a really great group of guys. And it was really my first exposure to Christian music. Though at the time, when they sent me down there from the station to go and introduce the group and do the concert, and 
all these fun things. They didn't tell me it was a Christian concert at the time. And so there I was, you know, I got down, I was listening to the music, and I was having a really good time, and it had a great message to it and everything, and things were going along just fine, and then this person comes walking up to me, and he hands me a Bible, and he says, God wants to tell you something. And he hands me the Bible, and he turns around and walks away. I mean, weird, right? <laughs> Who does that? Who does that? So then I open the Bible up, and boom, it pops open to the page. And guess what it was? Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. It just leapt off the page. And so I read it. And then I reread it. And then I reread it again. And that has stuck with me ever since. When God wants your attention, he'll get your attention. See, and he called somebody else in there to call me out of the spot I was in. The funny thing is, is once that happened and once I started getting into the Christian music and those kind of things, I was still on the air at Tanner and A doing my shifts, but I found myself, I just couldn't stand playing Led Zeppelin anymore. And I couldn't stand playing ACDC anymore. I couldn't, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to listen to it. See, God was changing me from the inside out. I just didn't realize it at the time. Because I didn't think there was anything wrong with me at the time. But God wanted to tell me something. He wanted to tell me that he had something better in store for me. So, wow. Now you know the rest of the story. Or part of it. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to explore the passage in Isaiah because this is exactly what I mentioned earlier. Jesus doesn't take us out of hard situations. He walks us through those situations in our lives. Even when we don't know that we're in the middle of one or we could be sinking down into that pit, he's always going to be there in time of need. And see, one of the things that I, I really learned from this, and hopefully everybody else can grab onto, is we can't learn from it if we don't experience it first. And he won't keep us from going through something that we need to learn from. Those are two real key points for us to really sink in and, and live out in our lives. We can't learn from it if we don't experience it first. And he won't keep us from going through something that we need to learn from. See, he knows. He's got the plan. He's got it all mapped out. We just don't know what it is. He reveals it in small portions to us as we go through our lives. So I have a question for you this morning. I love asking questions as I'm giving messages. Where in your life do you need to bring Jesus into the picture? Ooh, kind of a big question, isn't it? Kind of a tough question if we think about it. Where in your life do we need to bring Jesus in to invite him in? Now, he, he shows up every time. He brought me through the storm last Sunday, that storm. And see, I didn't even know how bad the storm was until the next morning when I could actually see how much damage there was and how bad it really was. But he brought me through it because I invited him into it to start with. So, as we go through the storms in our lives, do we just kind of shove out off to the side, like I was doing back in the side, because I had it all under control, or so I thought. You were doing well on your own, so you really didn't need God, right? But how well were you really doing? And if you're in this place in your life right now, then you're quite possibly what I call spiritually dead. It's that short-sightedness. Everything changes when Jesus enters the picture. Everything is spiritually dead until the spirit of life comes in. He brings that life into our lives. We're not truly living our lives until we have him part of our lives. And this is true of a person or a group or a nation or a religion. If you don't have God at the center of that life, 
then who or what is in control of that life or that religion or that country, that nation? Everything. Now, this, this goes back, and Terry, I'm sure you can probably really appreciate this. Back in the 60s, there was a commercial for Coca-Cola. It says everything goes better with Coke. And, you know, I live my life according to that. So everything goes better with God in it. <laughs> Terry is a big fan of Primordial Ooze, normally called Pepsi. I can barely get it out of my mouth. Um, but everything goes better with God in it. So Coke had something there. I just kind of modified it a little bit. So let's go on now to the series of the chosen and see what I'm talking about here. So last week, we saw how Jesus delivered Mary Magdalene from demonic possession. This time, we're going to see her clothed in her right mind and see what a difference it is. And today's focus is on the Jewish tradition of Sabbath or Shabbat. Okay? Now. It, too, is only an empty ritual if the presence of God isn't in it. And this is the experience of having Jesus in it with us as we go through it. This incarnation, then, brings life into Shabbat. So Shabbat is what? The celebration of the Sabbath, day of rest, correct? Probably not what you think, because the Jewish Shabbat runs on a different timeline than on Sundays, but we'll go into that some other time. So if God isn't in it, if Jesus isn't in it, the incarnation of Jesus being invited into it, then it doesn't really have that life. And often we wish to be delivered from our external circumstances that are around us, that are surrounding us in there. But see, God doesn't promise that he's gonna deliver us from the circumstances. Instead, everything changes when Jesus enters in when God comes into the circumstance. Usually he promises to simply walk us through them. And the difference is God may not rescue us, but God intersects our lives and changes us. And that's what I was talking about with the whole thing with Karen A down there and the Christian concert. And when they, you know, when, when I went through that and they handed me the Bible and everything, you know, it was, it was a change. God was changing me from the inside out. I didn't even know there was anything wrong because everything was going pretty cool, except the fact that I had shoved God kind of off to the side. But see, once God entered into the picture, then everything changed. I couldn't play that music anymore. I couldn't listen to that stuff because that was poison coming into my system. And unfortunately, I was poisoning thousands of other people by playing that music <laughs> at the time. But you don't realize it when you're in the midst of that circumstance. Until God enters in, until Jesus enters in and brings true life back into it, you don't realize how far you are. God may not rescue us, but God intersects our lives and changes us from the inside out. So we're going to go to a clip from this week's uh, episode of The Chosen, and here Nicodemus is uh, seeing Mary, formerly Lilith, as he knew her, and asked how she came to be healed. So let's go ahead and play that clip. It's you. It's real. Lilith. No, no, please, don't be frightened. My name is Nicodemus. I, I ministered to you, Lilith. I have an answer to that name. I am Mary. I was born Mary. But you were called Lilith, yes? Please, I must go. No, no, please, Mary. I, I'm desperate for your help, Mary. I'm, I'm a Pharisee. I'm visiting from Jerusalem. I'm a man of God. And I believe you have experienced a miracle, Mary. Are you really a Pharisee? Yes. I'm sorry, I wasn't... Uh, I'm not here to enforce Jewish law. So how do you know who I am? You really don't remember me at all. I burned incense. I don't remember. It's all a blur. Like, 
Let's go back into that. No, no, I don't want you to. I can't even imagine. But you, you are healed. That, that much is clear. I just want to understand how it happened. <laughs> the next two of us. <laughs> how long after my visit did you feel the change? It wasn't anything you did. It was someone else. Some one else? He called me Mary. He said, I am his. I am redeemed. And it was so. Six, no credit? Well, what does he look like? Is he a member of Sanhedrin? Would you at least know him if you saw him again? I don't know why I am sharing this with you. I, I don't understand it myself. But here is what I can tell you. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. So yes, I will know him for the rest of my life. <laughs> I have to be home to prepare for Shabbat, as I'm sure you do. So many of you are even hosting Shabbat dinner. It will be nothing like yours, I'm sure of that. I'm going to try. Shabbat Shalom, Mary. Wow. So somewhere around my house, I have lost my T-shirt that said, "I was once one way, but now I'm completely different." And the thing that is. I was going to wear that as I was giving the message this morning, but in my old age and forgetfulness, I can't remember where I put my shirt. His wife can't find it either. <laughs> it's in a very safe place somewhere. Shabbat Shalom, Mary, is what Nicodemus said. Now, did you notice what Nicodemus was focused on? What had he done? What had he said that made the change in her life that had completely converted her from the person he was before, she was before? Oh, it wasn't you. Oh, was it a member of the Sanhedrin? No. No. They were so focused on their rites, their rituals, and everything like that, and on the law and enforcing the law, they missed the whole point why they were supposed to be there ministering to the people. But Shabbat Shalom, which means peaceful rest. I was one way, but now I'm another. And the thing that happened in the middle was him. When Jesus comes in, a change is made. She was reconciled. She was restored. Her life was given back to her. She was dead in her sins, and now, now she is fully alive. Her soul was tormented, possessed. She was a different person, literally. And if you know anything about Old Testament and the way they did things back in the culture and society back in those days, a person's name will change depending upon the life that they live and their circumstances. And you've seen that many times in the Bible in the passages where their name changes from one thing to the next. She was a different person, literally. And then she was given rest for her soul. A 
transformation, a new beginning, restoration. See, so she was married again. She was reborn into the person that God intended her to be. Mary had been ransomed from her possession. Ransomed. And I want you to hang on to that word for a minute. I'm going to go ahead and reread our call to worship this morning. And this is from the New Living Translation. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. How can you read that and not understand what a loving God we have and what he wants for us in our lives today? See, I like this translation because it says, I have ransomed you, meaning your freedom was bought for a price. You were a slave to sin, and you were ransomed. You were called out of that existence. I have ransomed you away from that. You are now restored. You are now a new person, purchased by the blood and the love of Jesus. But see, that's not all. It says, I have called you by name, and you are mine. Can you imagine? God has that same calling on each and every one of our lives. God is calling us into a personal relationship with him. He wanted the people of Israel and us, by extension, to have that kind of bond. And I wanted to use the word bond. When you have a bond, it means that you are connected, that you are protected, that you are assured. But that doesn't seem that, you know, to, to some people, it doesn't mean that we're on easy street then. What it really means is we've got work to do. We've got work to do. One of the big Christian misconceptions is that once you're a believer, you're as good as gold, right? Happy life, no strife. Wrong. Nothing can be further from the truth. First, Notice what it said in there, that troubles will come to life. The passage doesn't say if you pass through the waters and fire, but when you pass through the waters and fire. We are not given the life of floating down a lazy river. Quite the opposite. If we are committed Christians, then we need to work hard for the kingdom. We got work to do, right? Truly, life in this fallen world is nothing more than a veil of tears and sorrow comes to everybody. Nobody is exempt. Second, let's take a look at, the, at what else it says in here. It says, notice that the people who go through the waters and the fire are the people who worship God. I have called you my name and you are mine. It is the people of God that get called. We're going to go through the waters. We're going to go through the fire. But he's going to walk with us hand in hand. We have to invite him into those fires. We have to invite him into the storms of life. We have to invite him in to be with us. In other words, we have to be committed Christians in order to have God walk with us hand in hand. We have to reach out our hand so that he can take it. We gotta reach out our hand. We gotta take that first step. This passage was written to his people, and this passage was written for you and me. Not unbelievers, not people who don't care, not people that have no time for God. This was written for us. Teachings that promise that you're going to have your best life in terms of comfort or external successes. If you just follow Jesus, well, those teachings are untrue. Those teachings are untrue. So last night, I posted up on Facebook. I don't know if you guys follow them or read them or, or anything like that, but I talked about all the all the stuff that's out there in the world and all of the different agendas that are being presented and all these points of view and everything that are presented as facts. And then I posted up a verse that went along with it that said, unless it comes from God, 
unless it's rooted in God and God planted those roots, stay away from it. Stay far away from it. It's the blind leading the blind. And this is what it is. We, we have to be, we have to discern the truth out of all the lies that are out there. We have to have a discerning nature, a gift of the Spirit, a fruit of the Spirit. God promises us a fulfilled life, but that doesn't equate to an easy street. That doesn't equate to the lazy river to just go ahead and float down. The sentiment that we sometimes hear that people find it hard to believe that God is real if they're not feeling happy comes from the notion that God's job is to make it easy for his children, and that is not the case. That's not the case. It doesn't work that way. Happiness is an emotional response to a given situation, not a state of your being. God is talking about the state of your being. He wants you to have a fulfilled life. He doesn't say you're going to be happy all the time. We got work to do. Having a true relationship with God will fulfill us for an eternity and happiness will only last as long as that response to that given situation can last. So if you have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and we all do, wouldn't you rather do it with Jesus at your side? With God walking with you hand in hand, walking you through that valley, doesn't say he's going to leave you there. That verse never says he's going to leave you there. He's going to walk you through it and beyond it to the fulfilled life that he has for you. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and have heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear. And the burden I give you is light. And here Jesus is telling us about the baggage that he carry around is weighting them down. And I've talked about that many times in my messages. I said, you got to take that baggage and you got to leave it at the foot of the cross. And you got to leave it there. Because when you carry it around, it's going to wear you down. It's going to wear you out. Soul crushing, if you will. Yet there's still work to be done. It's going to be a different kind of work than you're used to. It will give our souls rest. Shabbat shalom. Peaceful rest. Instead of the struggles, he will give us rest. He'll give us peace in our souls. Peace in our souls means we're going to have a fulfilled life. A fulfilled purpose. As he reveals it, as our relationship grows, God reveals his will for our lives to us. His word tells us so and he promises to us. You're going to be in a yoke one way or another. Why not be yoked to God? Who else would you rather have as your yoke me? Seriously. And fourth, we can invite Jesus into our struggle. So we got another clip here as Mary tentatively prepares for Shabbat. Let's watch the clip. Where are you? Oh, sorry, I'm 
I'm James, this is Thaddeus. We were told this would be a good place to come. We can leave if it's off. Oh, uh, no, please come in. You're most welcome here. So, can we help? Oh, no. Well, uh, yes, I You guys know what I'm doing. <laughs> I see food. That's a victory. If I'm not doing something or doing something wrong, you can tell me. Oh, nonsense. It's already great. Can't remember the last time I was invited to Shabbat dinner. Me? Never. You've never been to Shabbat? Of course I've been to one. Been to lots. Just never got invited. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the extra seat for? Oh, uh, for Elijah. Am I right? I remember my mother always setting an extra place for Elijah. That's only for Passover. Just once a year it's said. Well, say that comes, I'll have a head start on setting up. <laughs> 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 Can I read it for you, Mary? Stop it, Barnaby. I read better than you. My father taught me. Very impressive. <sighs> oh, uh, is the first star out? Yes, let's eat. Like I said, they're very popular. Or it's a Pharisee here to shut us down for letting you be here. <laughs> Hello, Mary. Oh. It's good to see you. Yes. <laughs> no matter what we do, if Jesus isn't at the center of it, it's empty of his power. It's empty of his life-giving power, his redemptive power. It's empty of his spirit. See, I love coming here because I can feel the spirit of Jesus in our midst. Because as we're gathered together, his word promises that he is here in the midst. His power is in the midst. In this episode of The Chosen, it will show us, uh, and we'll see this on Wednesday. It shows us four Shabbat celebrations. Simon's simultaneously being performed, but only one of them has Jesus in it. That's why. I don't want to be rude, but would it be okay if, if I... Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. Please come in. I just never thought of you done. I have guests here. Uh, this is my first time. I don't know what I'm doing. Rabbi, Rabbi. You already know these men. They are students of mine. I trust they have been polite. Of course. Your guests can take the seat, yes, ma'am? Oh, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, please have a seat. I keep saying of course a lot. <laughs> um, Francis is the man I told you about who, uh, who helped me. Yes, yeah, Mary told us so much about you. Oh, I hope not too much. I'm Barnaby. This is Shula. She is blind. Ah. In case you couldn't tell. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I don't actually know your name. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Oh. Well, apparently something good can come from Nazareth. <laughs> Mary, I'm honored to be here. Why don't you begin? Oh, no, I, I couldn't now that you're here. You must. Thank you, but this is your home, and I would love for you to do it. Okay. I'll just, um, I'll just read from this now. May the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. And God completed on the seventh day his work that he did. And God. Mm. Can you imagine? Have a knock on the door and it's Jesus wants to come in. The place of honor for Shabbat, for a celebration, the host it's a place of honor to be able to do the readings in that society. 
And Jesus said, no, this is your home. He wanted her to have that honor. He placed with her that, that gift, Jesus at the center. His power, his spirit was in the room. So as I always do, I've got another question. How's about this? Are we living our lives to please ourselves and others? Or are we humbling ourselves before God and allowing him into our lives and to guide and direct our futures? When I wrote this, it hit me hard. <laughs> and I had to, had to think about this over and over again. So are we living our lives to please ourselves and others? Are we humbling ourselves before God and allowing in, him into our lives to guide and direct our futures? See, we're all living one way, separated from God existing our way through life. And then we were introduced to Jesus, the living God, and in the process found that a life that is completely different is possible if we let him in, if we invite Jesus in. And the thing that happened in between was him. Would have been more effective with the t-shirt, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> Likewise, we will all walk through the floodwaters in our lives. We will all face the flames of hardship and loss. And Jesus warned us about this in, in the passages. And he said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. He promised that we would have hardship in this fallen creation. But he also promised us to walk through it with us. Let's invite him in so that the rest of the Shabbat, that only comes from when God will be in it with us, we can only do this if we invite him in, into the very center of our lives, not off into the fringe, not pushing him off to the side, because we got it all under control. We don't have anything under control. God is in control of everything, everything. What are you doing that you can invite Jesus into the center of today? Shabbat Shalom. Let us pray. Almighty God, we bless you for our lives and we give you praise for your abundant mercy and the grace that we receive. We thank you for your faithfulness, even though we are not that faithful to you at times. Lord Jesus, we ask you to give us all around peace in our mind, our body, our souls, and in our spirit. We ask you to heal and remove everything that is causing stress and grief and sorrow in our lives. And please, Lord, please guide us on the path through life and give us that Shabbat Shalom, the restful peace in our souls today. Let your peace reign in our family. Let your peace reign in our place of work, in our businesses, everything that we lay hands on, Lord. We invite you into the center of those things. We invite your power and your spirit, your grace, your mercy, and your love into the center of our lives today. Let your angels of peace go ahead of us. And when we go out and stay by our side, when we return. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to tease you a little bit, Mark. See, when I prayed that anything that you would say that was not of God would just kind of blow away like the dust in the wind, I meant I talked about Coke. <laughs> If you, I can't imagine not being touched. I mean, I can't imagine there was too much for dry eyes as we went through this message today. To see that transformation. Mark and I's life 
other than that we're about 10 years difference in age, are rather parallel in the things we've been through. And we both grew up in the church. We both had our desert time. We both came back. I can specifically remember that September evening when God called me to my knees and I felt like, what do we do? I felt that awe and that wonder that Mary did. And it is when we take communion each week that I'm transported right back to that time where I remember what God did for me. So it's not just something that we do. It's not just like uh, people, we just pray before a meal because that's what we do. It's not, we don't just turn on the turn signal because that's what we do when we turn, when we drive. It's not something that we just mechanically do. This is meaningful and it, it brings us back each to our own faith origin stories. So as we hear these words, remember the, that time. For it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Take Near the end of the meal, he took the cup, and after filling it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. And this is the beauty of the scriptures. And they teach us, and they remind us. And in this instance, the scriptures remind us that as often as we eat and spread and drink in this cup, we are to do so until Christ's return. And I'm sure I'm not the only one here who are watching online that has said, Come, Lord Jesus, come, because of the way of the world today. So let this be that reminder. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and drink. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, we come before you in, in remembrance of what this meal represents. And yes, sometimes we kid around with each other and we have fun with each other. But when it comes down to it, Father, we know that your son selfishly crawled up onto that cross, had his hands and feet nailed to that cross for each one of us. Father, we continue to pray that this ministry would reach out to those who feel marginalized, who have been shunned by the church, who may not, don't even have any idea who you are. Let us reach those people, Father. Show us and guide us the way that we can help them have the rest that Pastor Mark taught us about today. In Jesus' precious name. sermon. Thank you so much. And uh, it really hit home for me. Because I know without Jesus in my heart, I could not be here and standing in front of any of you because I feared so many things. So thank you, Jesus, for bringing me to this place. And uh, right now I'm supposed to pray for others. <laughs> and I pray that you all pray for me too. <laughs> so is there anybody that here that would like prayer? got quite a few listed already, so I guess I'll just begin. Whew, Father God, we come to you this morning with honor and praise, for you are a God who blots out our sins. Your love for us is beyond measure. Whew. Sorry. Oh, there is not a place we can go that you are not right there 
with us, to help us through any situation that may arise. He loves us. He loves us so much. He loves us unconditionally. For we are not worthy of love most of the time. But he still does love us. Oh, in Isaiah 43.10, you are my witness, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. Sorry, you really put me into this. <laughs> so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Father God, we thank you that you have called us by name. You will not forsake us nor leave us. You are always with us. And for that reason, we pray for one another. For there is power in your name, Jesus. Father God, I lift up um, Terry and Diane's daughter, Amanda, to you this morning. I pray for continued strength, and I pray that she will receive all the care that she needs for the healing of her body. I pray you give her rest and comfort as the doctors help her through this trial. Give the doctors wisdom to do what is needed for her well-being. Comfort her daughter, Kelly and Terry and Diane, and the family members. Let them rest knowing you are in control. You are walking with them through this trial they are facing. Help them to lean on you for strength in each new day. We lift up Harold and Diane to you. We ask that you strengthen them, heal them, comfort them, speak to them, Lord Jesus. Let them rest in the knowledge of you. Let them recall your word from the Bible to get them through each passing day. For your word is strength to our souls. We lift up Mark and Lori. We ask that you replenish them and renew them daily for the tasks that they have ahead. Give them courage and wisdom to help them through each and every situation that may arise with their parents. I pray for Jane's cousin, Gary, who was in a terrible car accident this weekend. He has a collapsed lung, and a friend of hers, Sherry Wallace, who had a car accident also that hurt her wrist and her thumb. Father God, be with them and heal them as only you can, Lord Jesus. For you formed them and you know them and you know what is best. Give the doctors wisdom to heal their bodies, Lord God, to help them in their path to healing that only you can do. We lift up Joe and Terry and Steve to you, Father God. We know, you know their innermost being. You formed them and created them. You know what their needs are. You know what healing needs to be done in their bodies. You are the great physician, the healer of all our needs. I ask you today to heal their bodies and keep their minds steady on you, Jesus. The trials in this life are many, but with you, we will get through them all together. Father God, I pray for all our children and grandchildren, to name a few, Matt, Demetrius, Cody and his wife, Vienna, Taylor, Colt, Riley, Dylan and Jace. Lord, lead them in the ways of righteousness. Set them firmly on the road that leads to you. Lead out the friends that they will lead, that will lead them astray and into dark places. Help them discern what is right and what is wrong. Give them the courage to do what is right also, or always. Help them to stand and follow you through the storms in this life. Let their light shine among them and with you in their lives, in Jesus' name. For you are God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, 
to be with Grace Street Church, that we will win souls for you, Jesus. For you are our great God and Heavenly Father. In Jesus' holy name. Well, this uh, brings to a close our portion of our online portion of our service today. We thank you for joining us. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to go into the message of the music that we have planned for you today and uh, listen to the words and listen to what God is telling you through that music as well. And uh, we just thank you for joining us here today. And please receive this blessing for reconciliation and forgiveness. Dear Lord, help us to do our very best every day to affirm one another and to remove the barriers that seem to hinder our relationships and keep us at a distance from one another. Please give us your grace to heal our short tempers, our destructive habits, and to help to let go of the grudges that we hold on so tightly to. Inspire us, dear God, to be re-gifters of your grace, your mercy, your blessings, and your love. Lord, lead us to be vessels and ambassadors of your forgiveness, of your healing love, and of your wisdom. Loving and gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us so that we will have the courage to reach out to those who have offended or hurt us. And with your inspiration, Heavenly Father, May our efforts heal the wounds that hurt our families, that hurt our church, that hurt our world. Lord, lead us and our hearts to worship you more fully each and every day. Lord, help us to reach out our hands to you and bring us into the center of our lives, not off to the sides. Bless us, dear Lord, that we may have hearts full of your peace that Shabbat Shalom, that rest that we can find in you. May we strive to be re reconciled to you and to one another and help us to always remember and live by the words that Jesus shared with his disciples when he taught them to pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Because you gave us that great promise that while we were yet sinners, Lord, you died on the cross for us to bring us that salvation. We thank you unendingly and forever.